money, Jordan Bell fur. Stacking penny stocks while I'm flipping these birds. Sipping on Ciroc, trip them up with the words. I done popped the molly and I think it's be my third. What is going on, DJ Nation? Kenny Kim here bringing you another Fantasy Gall Degenerates podcast this week for the Masters, as usual. I am here with everybody's favorite Canadian, Tyler Tambley. Tyler, what is up, my friend? Going on, Kenny. We're back at it again. First major of the season. I can't be more excited. I talked about this all last week, at least the last two or three weeks. I know people hated on some of it, but I said my truths. I said, here's the deal. I haven't enjoyed these events as much as some other people have. That's fine. I could not be more excited for this event coming up. It's going to be awesome. Lots of good stuff going on. But before we get into it, I want to remind everyone very quickly, this show is brought to you and presented by ShipItNation.com. You guys can head over there right now. Master's Week, good time to check it out. You can use the code HOOP15 to get 15% off any membership over there at ShipItNation.com. What's going on, Kenny? We got uh, Friday night. We're recording this. We should let people know, right? Going to do this Friday night before him. We had the pricing out super early. We don't got the 5K range. We'll get to all the tiers and whatnot in a little bit. But how you doing, my friend? You changed your shirt. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Now, before we actually get into this week and do all our segments, Tambo does have a special announcement for us. Uh, Tambo, why don't you go ahead and tell the people what you just told me? Yeah. I was trying to just kick it to you first. And then that, like, you know, with our good chemistry, the back and forth there. But you sent it right back so quickly. So I do appreciate it. I do want to say this like obviously this is extremely tough for me but I, I do have a, a bit of a decision that i've made and i talked to kenny about it before the show talked to the producer talked to mayo one of those things and just the way it's been and, and the way this year is going and just everything that's going on i did make a very difficult decision so i will be stepping away from the fantasy golf degenerates podcast at least for a little while um probably a, a little longer than a little while but definitely gonna just step away take a break from that work on the business over at Ship and Nation, have some other stuff personally to take care of, nothing to worry about, just things that I'm just going through right now that I'm going to spend some time on. So I can't say enough good things. Thank you to everybody along the way. Obviously, Kenny, my partner in crime, more on that. I mean, obviously, just been with you forever now. It's been so great. Everybody that supported along the way with Mayo and we've been with Roto Grinders and we have Blue Wire. We had all these different people come out and help us out along the way there, but just been an awesome experience. I will stick around this year for the majors. And for the President's Cup. So didn't want to do this last week on April Fool's or anything like this. This is legitimate. So uh, really difficult decision. But I'll still be out there. The content over at Ship It Nation doesn't stop. Obviously, I'm going to continue to do that. I'll be on the Mayo Show in studio every Wednesday. And who knows what the future holds and where I'll be at. You guys know where to reach me on X at Totag and Tambo. You can find me if you need anything. It's nothing to worry about. Just really made a, a tough decision that if I was going to move on one thing, it ended up being this one, unfortunately. So been a ton of fun working with you, Kenny. Obviously, I love it. We'll be at the President's Cup in September, hanging out, doing some content from there too, but I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be around. I just won't be on this show. I will say, we won't announce it yet, but we do have a very exciting, someone I'm very excited about to sort of pass the torch to and come in back. That goes back to everything else too, just to say a couple more names like Zach to Brad to now you know, me hopping on and being on it for this long, it's been one hell of an experience, Kenny. So I appreciate it, my friend. Yeah, I will say that when Brad first told me, when me and Brad were on for the first three years, and he told me that he needed to step down, he uh, he decided to go get his master's. Uh, this was back in 2018, if I remember correctly. Uh, and he told me that he had uh, 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 a good replacement, uh, like Tyler Tambley. And I was like, oh, I don't really know who he is. Uh, now the funny thing is, uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to work out. Uh, and then here we are six years later, you call Tambo, one of my good friends out here working week in and week out together. It's been an honor, uh, working with Tyler, uh, one of the best DFS players out there. Not only that, one of the better people, uh, out there, uh, been really good to me, been really good to, uh, the people that have been listening, uh, I know you guys who have been listening long enough have won enough money uh, because of Tyler, uh, so you should thank him for that. Uh, we are going to miss him, but this is not really goodbye. Um, you know, he'll be back for the majors, uh, and then maybe after he uh, gets uh, gets a little bit, um, gets everything under control and everything goes well, starts going well, running smoothly, more smoothly than it is, then maybe he could just come back. Uh, well, so I'm not going to throw that out uh, of the realm of possibility. So I always told Tambo, if you ever want to come back, you are more than welcome. But they did tell me who the new host is going to be. They ran it by me first. I, basically, I was able, and I agreed, uh, this guy is going to be great. Uh, so I do not think that you will miss 
anything, uh, except maybe Tambo and his pale white Canadian skin, uh, based on uh, it, 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 in that little screen that you see. Uh, nobody cares. We're Carter uh, on the back right. Of course, you're going to miss that. But Tambo, you've been a great guy. I thank you so much. Uh, for carrying this pod. It would not have lasted as long. We're, I mean, we're on our ninth year. Uh, it would not have lasted this long without you. Um, I can guarantee you that. You, you you coming in and bringing your knowledge and your prowess uh, of DFS has been nothing but uh, sensational for this show. Uh, and I want to thank you uh, thank very, very much you, for, uh, Honestly. for being for being my buddy, being my cohort for these last six years. I'll still be here, my friend. We'll talk. I know you got a great story lined up, so you're the guy that carries this thing. The snakes and rats. From last week just went on and on it was in the discord all week just having a great time talking about that but just to say it uh you said it brad left to get his masters i'm leaving at the masters not at that the start, masters. but shout out to brad always a good time the fantasy golf Jones is not going anywhere like you said there's a great person lined up to come in for me to pass the torch to and i could be more excited again thank you to you thank you to everybody out there for watching all your support along the way and you'll still be able to find me week in week out you know where i'm at over at ship it nation Got to take care of some things, get it all taken care of, get back to it. And then maybe, like said, Kenny said, maybe even outside of the majors, you'll see me back. But for now, that's the news. That's the announcement. Bad news out of the way. Good news ahead. We've got the Masters, Kenny. It's a big week. Excited for it. We don't have a Lister League to talk about right now. We don't have that. You'll have your story time. We'll get to the tiers. We'll break it down. We'll do some comparisons. Very interested to hear your Rory take with the Justin Thomas caddy bones out. And you're having some caddy battles on X today out there. So... What do you want to talk about first, my friend? Where are we going with this now? I don't know. I, I'm still still a little bit shocked because, of course, Tambo told me this like two minutes before the show started. But, uh, like I said, we are recording this on a Friday. Uh, the Valero Texas Open is starting, is already started. Uh, it's not going that well. <laughs> it's not great. Now, it looks like I I might be able to push my forecast shows through the cup, but we will see. Uh, now, I did we did have Sigeeth as one of our bets, so... Uh, I think he's still in the lead right now. I haven't looked in the last couple of hours. Uh, so hopefully this week ends well. So so no recap, nothing like that. But let's go ahead and start with the story time with Kenny. Uh, I've been saving this one for a couple of years. Um, the first reason I've been saving this for a couple of years is for legal reasons. Uh, I do think the statute of limitations has passed. Uh, I think I will be fine telling the story now. All right, so a couple of years ago. I was in a, I was doing a site visit in D.C. Not the best part of D.C. Uh, let's just say that. Okay. And so I was leaving. I was leaving the site. Uh, and I was at a stoplight. I was going to make a right turn. Uh, and so I look at the crosswalk. No one's in the crosswalk. I start making my right. And I'm the type of guy who, you know, accelerates as the turn goes, right? So I I, I don't go slow. Once I, once I start making that turn right, I accelerate. Like, a person should drive. Okay. Uh, and so what happened is I saw, I, I turned right. There's no one, there's no one in the crosswalk. I look at the crosswalk. We're fine. I turn right and I accelerate. And this guy jumps out in front of me. Uh, I guess he didn't think I was going to accelerate. Basically what happened. Uh, I did not see him in time. Uh, so basically I accelerated through this guy. I uh, hit the left, hit my left bumper. Okay. And when I hit him, with my car, and I drive a 2021 Toyota 4Runner Limited. It's a very, very tall car, very bulky car. Um, and so I hit him, right? And I'm still accelerating. So at, at one point in time, I'm looking to my left, and I see him in the air, like, parallel to, like, my vision. Like, I see his feet, like, just dangling in the air. So I hit the brakes then, because that's when I noticed I hit him. Uh, I hit the brakes, and then, of course, he just flies forward in the air, like 20, 30 seats, just I like spinning in the air. It's like wild shit. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, so I stopped the car. I stopped the car. I uh, try to get some composure uh in me. And I do what any sensible human being would do at that time. You know, I hit the gas and I fucking roll the fuck out. I'm just kidding. I did not do that. I, was I, <laughs> I, 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 I did not do that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So so, so what happens is, okay, so I turn, so I saw he's laying in the middle of the road now. Um, I turn into this uh, gas station, which is right by where I hit. Uh, I park next to the, uh, next to the sidewalk. So I'm right there. Uh, I, I step out of the car. And this guy is literally like struggling to move. Like I'm pretty sure I broke his hip. 
uh, when it comes down to it, because I I hit it, I hit him right in the hip, and he just flew in the air. Um, and then he landed and rolled and like spun. It's horrible. Like I mean, at that point in time, I was almost in shock. At that point in time, right? Because I mean, like in that type of situation, like how do you handle this, right? And so I, I go out of the car. Uh, you know, first thing I do is I call nine one one. Call nine one one. Nine one one's on the way, and this guy's just starting to move again on the road so i'm like okay so in this type of situation i don't really know what to do like should i go and help him like should i try and get him off the street so people don't run him over and stuff like that and of course the cars behind him behind me just they don't give a fuck they're in the cars they're driving by him and so i'm like what the fuck calm down chill stop right and so what this situation reminded me of at this point in time, like my brain was just going 100 miles per hour, right, uh, at this point in time. And it was trying to make me, I guess it was trying to make me, like, I don't know, not feel the, the stress of that moment, right? And so the first thing that comes to my mind uh, at this point in time was Revenge of the, of the Sith. If you ever watch Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith, the last scene, okay, uh, it's 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 Anakin versus um, Obi Wan Kenobi by like a lava lit, right? And Anakin and, and Obi Wan has the high ground, right? And Obi Wan's like, "Yo, don't do some stupid shit." And you know, I have the high ground. I'm going to win. So basically, what it comes down to is my truck was the high ground, right? And and the dude I hit was Anakin. So the dude, and so at this point in time, I, I, I'm looking at him, and he starts crawling, and it's literally the scene from the end of Revenge of the Sith. Like when, when when Anakin is like crawling out of like the lava, you know what I'm saying? All hemmed up and stuff like that. And literally, this is like going on in my mind at that time. Um, and so I think to my and I I almost break out a smile because I think it's funny. And that would have been like the worst fucking thing to possibly do. Like what what the fuck? This guy just hit somebody and now he's smiling and laughing about it. That would not have been appropriate, okay? But that's just the way my brain was thinking at that moment in time. It just looked like Anakin trying to get out of the fucking lava, like. Took him forever. Like, I don't even know. Uh, to me, it felt like 20 minutes to get off the fucking road, right? So he finally gets to the sidewalk. And at this point in time, there's a crowd. There's a crowd uh, that's gathered around uh, in this area. And like I said, you know, not the best neighborhood in D.C. Um, so there's, like, a, people walking out of their homes and, and, like, a group of, like, old aunties. Like, these aunties are the type of aunties that wear, like, church clothes, like a Sunday church clothes, every day. So, you know, like, they're, like, mainstays of, like, the community. You know what I'm saying? When you see, like, the black aunties that wear church clothes on a daily basis, they basically run this shit, like, in the town, right? In that little community. And so they come up, uh, and, and they're basically I overhear them talking, uh, and I guess supposedly this guy is, like, is, like, some, some community leader, right? A young guy, like, uh, like he was like he he was like a camp counselor at the boys and girls club across the street. Like works with kids and youth to make them like better people and shit like this, right? And I was like, oh my god, this is horrible, right? And so, but then like the crowd starts getting bigger, like more and more people. And they're like, oh, that's Duran. I'm I i do not even know the guy's name, so I'm just making up a name. Um. And, and, and like they're like, oh, that's so and so. Oh my god, what happened? And like the aunties are like pointing at me, literally just like pointing at me, right? And like, oh yeah, I was like, oh shit, this is this is not, not good, not good. For the first time in my life, I was happy to see the police. The police rolled up. All right, so the police rolls up, you know, and, and so they, I tell them what happened, blah blah blah. And, you know, he wasn't in the crosswalk technically um and so yeah i tell them that because you know i don't want to like i'm going to tell the truth and i don't want to get in even more trouble than possible and so uh and so you know the cops are talking to me at this point in time the adrenaline and the shock sort of wearing off I, i'm getting really really um my mouth is really really dry stuff like that there's a 7-eleven right there I, I asked the police officer i gave him all my information stuff like that um, and he, I asked him, like, can I go to the 7-Eleven and just get something to drink? My mouth is so dry uh, at this point in time. So we go, I, I start, well, he says, yeah, it's fine. So I walk to the 7-Eleven and I notice like three, three of the guy, three young kids following me uh, to the 7-Eleven, right? 
and, and I'm looking back and I'm like, oh, okay. And I look back again, I'm looking at the cops and I'm not paying attention at all. Um, and so I was like, hmm. So I just keep walking. I, you know, I, I'm not trying to jump to conclusions here. Uh, I keep walking, but right before I get to the 7-Eleven door, I turn around and I pull out a pack. You know, I used to smoke. Actually, I still smoke. I, I'm not, I don't smoke on air as much anymore because I'm trying to quit, but it's been like a five month process. Anyways, um, so, so I pull out my pack of Newports, you know, light one up outside, outside there. And the guys are coming with me and I just pull out, pull it out. And I thought, you guys want to smoke? And they all took a cigarette and then we just started talking and they're like, what happened, man? And so I told them exactly what happened. They understood. Uh, they were like, uh, it, 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 like we know. You, by the end, they're like, we know this wasn't like uh, you're doing this on purpose, or like you know you have some bad intentions or something like that. They're very, very reasonable, which was, I was very, very happy about because at one point in time when I was there before the cops came, it felt like the end of training day, like Denzel. Right. You know, like Denzel with like the whole crowd of people around him, except my ass would not have said, you know, King Kong ain't got shit on me. That would not have gone well. That would not have gone well. Anyways, so I give these guys and so we we're, we're chit chatting and I go in, I end up buying them some some drinks and I buy myself a drink, uh, you know, like a sweet tea or something like that. And I walk back out uh, to the police, uh, to the police. Uh, the guys finally ambulance finally comes. Uh, takes him. He can't walk. Um, he's he's really, really. I mean, I felt horrible. Like I felt like a horrible, horrible person. Um, and so you know that whole thing happens. The crowd dissipates. I'm fine. I have. I'm sort of still in shock at this point in time because I don't know if you've ever hit. This is just. It's a really shocking type deal. I mean, you really basically I fucked up somebody's life, right? At least for that moment. You know, what I'm saying it's like it's not a really good fucking feeling. Uh. And so I, I didn't want to drive. Um, I didn't drive for a month or two after that. Um, and like, so I had my, I had my friend and his girlfriend come pick me up. Uh, they drove my car back. I rode uh, in my friend's car. And again, you know, the, I talked to the cop. The cop was like, uh, you know, we'll file a report. Uh, and then I had already called my insurance at that time, told them what happened, uh, stuff like that. So the insurance knew what was going on. The insurance said, you know, we'll wait for the police report number. Uh, once the police report number comes out, you know, we'll do everything we need to do to take care of him. Like, great. Okay. Uh, because I mean, this guy obviously needs something from me because I mean, you know, I, it's, that's what insurance is for, right? That's what insurance is for. Okay. And so, um, and so that happens. I leave, you know, two months goes by, um, you know, I call my insurance and they're like, uh, so anything other, like no police report, four months go by. I call back, no police report. Six months go by, call back, no re police report. They're dropping the case, uh, the insurance is, because it's been six months and they have there is no um, police report for it. Uh, they did not, and they still haven't filed. It's two years now, and they still have not filed a police report. I have called the police, the police station to talk with my incident number. They give you like an incident number when something like this happens. And, and so I gave them the incident number. They don't even have it on record anymore. My incident number. Like, I don't know what happened. Like, and the thing is, they don't know the name of the guy that I hit. So like, I can't even try and find the guy. And, and, and because like the guy was obviously fucked up. Right. And like, I, I don't know what I would have done. It's not like I could cover his medical bills or something like that. That's why I have insurance, but I just wanted to make sure the guy was okay. Right. I mean, I, for all I know, the guy's dead. Like, I have no clue still what happened to this guy. So, so I guess it was funny in the beginning. Now it's getting sort of morbid. Uh, because, like, I, I, I still have no clue what this guy, what happened to this guy. And it, it bothers me on a daily basis. Because, I mean, like, I, I could have really fucked up this dude's life. Um, and and it, was, it was a horrible, horrible situation. But, I, I, and two years later, still nothing. Uh, I've, I've got to call the police station. I, I'd say now probably every couple of months. Um, and I guess what's happening across the United States in a lot of urban cities where the police just aren't doing as much as they used to for some one reason or another, um, either due to lack of staff, uh, lack of people wanting to be police, lack of administration, um, stuff like that, whatever the reason is, 
I guess that's the reason why this skated by the wayside. Uh, and so, and so I have no idea what happened to this guy. If anybody out there listening to the show knows a guy who, who, who uh, is on uh what, what's it? 34th street in Southeast DC. Uh, you know, who used to be a, who was a camp counselor at the Boys and Girls Club. If you guys know what happened to the guy, or if you know him, just tell him that, I don't know, somebody get in touch with him. Because it was one of the wildest, wildest days, uh, things that have ever, ever happened to me. And, and and there's no closure of it. And it's horrible. It's like, it's it's like the worst feeling in the fucking world every time I talk about it. And, and, and I know that the story was, funny in the beginning because that's literally what was going on in my mind i was like this is anakin fucking skywalker but you know uh yeah i still want to know what happened to the guy so that's my story time with kenny i don't know how funny it was but i've been trying to get that off my chest for a long long time uh because it eats at me on on a constant basis so this is like a therapy session this is like not even a story time it's like therapy session with Kenny getting this on his chest I have some follow ups over here two mainly one what do you think the guys that ended up taking your smokes and drinks were actually following you for I have no I was was having worried I think what they mentioned something when I was there they thought that I was going to run run away away. okay so they they thought I was going to run away now I could have looked back and I'm like you idiots my car is right there but like the police hasn't haven't done nothing about this so far. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten back to me, even if my car was there. I don't know because they just didn't. Nothing ever came of it, so I have no clue what happened to this guy. Number two, don't you think he is alive? Because if he died, then there would have like had to been a police report. So for at least a guy could be in a wheelchair. He could have had something else happen, a hip surgery, or whatever. But you got to think he's alive and feel. I good hope to God he is. I, yeah. I, I I have no idea, no fucking clue, no clue. All I know is like this guy could have been like the next Martin Luther King Jr. and I fucking drilled his ass. Like community fucking leader. Like like really really like community like strong like better trying to make the kids better. It's like horrible. Like I can see it's horrible. Uh, so I, I have no idea. I have but no you, idea. You did, I, you did run very good in that situation where you got away with it. Try to be honest. You did the right thing. Mm-hmm. You ended up getting away with well, it. I and didn't now the break only any laws. thing eating at you is you don't know what happened. You don't no, know the, the outcome. First thing is, I didn't break any laws, really. Uh, I was sort of joking about the statute of limitations. The guy wasn't in the crosswalk. So you, you were ready to fight the court case of the guy that you don't know where he is and didn't get reported on that might have killed. But you were still ready to fight the court case, is what you're saying. Well, you, yeah, you, because I ain't trying to lose all my money, yeah, right? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I ain't trying to lose all my money. I, so, I mean, but I mean, I, you know, it doesn't really matter at that point in time. I just felt bad for the guy. And that's why we have insurance. Insurance covers shit like that. That's, you know, if something happens, your insurance covers it. That's what it's there for. Uh, and so, yeah, it was a crazy day. Um, I didn't drive for a couple of months afterwards uh, because it, I was shook. Sure. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and so so that's my story time with Kenny. I, I I maybe it wasn't as funny as I thought it was going to be. Well, I think it was necessary. Maybe not as funny, but very necessary for a for yeah. a guy Kenny to get like, that. I off feel better job. telling people about this. That is true. That is true. The basically therapy session with Kenny. Uh, you know, couch time with Kenny. That sounds sort of bad. Yeah. Um yeah, I don't know about couch time with Kenny. All right. So so that's anything before we get into this week. No, we got a good one, man. I will say this. We're going to get to it, but uh, it is Friday. Like you said, Rory is in the booth sitting T4 right now. So we may get some more storyline when we get to this coming around and people are checking this out on Monday and whatnot. We'll see what ends up happening. But did do have the bet on uh, Akshay. I should have. I, I bet him last week. I told everybody on the pod. He let me down. Came T11. I had a T, uh, T8 each way. And he, or a, a top eight each way, sorry. And he ends up becoming the first round leader. So I did the only bet I skipped in between last week and this week is the first round leader for this week on him. So hopefully he closes the job up and gets it done. Curly up five strokes, but nothing more on the Valero, Kenny. We'll see how it goes and how it ends. But excited to talk about the Masters with you, of course. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports. It's also the fastest growing fantasy app in the industry. I personally like the Pick'em games. 
Pick whether your favorite players will have a higher or lower stat total in this week's game for a chance to win big. Can win up to 100 times your money in a single night. Pick between two and five players to build a pick em entry. Can also make rivals picks, which pits two players against each other. Now, the reason I like the Pick'em games is because of these things called Scorchers. There's these little chili peppers next to the golfer's names, and if you click on that, it adds to your multiplier, so you can win even more money. Sign up today with promo code MAYO and get your first deposit doubled up to $100, as well as an instant Pick'em special. Must be 18 or over and present in the state where Underdog Fantasy operates. Terms apply. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-522-4700. Or visit www.ncpgambling.org. All right, so let's get to the course. I mean, you guys know what the course is. I'll go over it anyways, but you guys know. All right, so Augusta National Golf Club is a 7,500-plus yard par 72, four par threes, four par fives. The par fives are where the majority of the scoring comes from, um, as they are the four easiest holes on the course. And the six par fours over 450 yards are where golfers will need to you know, hold on and just try and make par. Uh, a couple of changes in the last couple of years uh, that they have made uh, on 13 and and number two. On 13, a couple of years ago, they added 35 yards uh, to, to the hole with a brand new tee box. This tee box actually uh, shrunk the window to hit a good drive. Uh, so it actually has made that court, made 13 a little bit tougher last year compared to other years. Usually it was one of the easiest courses uh, easiest holes on the course, and it's still not overly difficult, but it did play more difficult than it had in the past. Um, now, uh, now the one people who were affected basically by this are the people who might really who hit the you know, who cuts right-handed golfers who hit cuts off the tee. The hole is in the shape of a banana, you know, with a huge right-to-left dog leg with the narrow with the window to hit a good drive being so narrow. You know, it it makes it tough for cutters uh, off the tee to hit that fairway, but I'm not saying don't play cutters. I think we've all come to the realization that, you know, that narrative where you have to play a draw to win this event that's sort of gone by the wayside with DJ in 2020, Rom uh, last year. All they do is cut the ball nowadays. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I'm not saying that. But for that hole specifically, uh, you know, people who cut the ball, it makes it even more difficult, uh, that hole. Now, uh, on the second hole, it's a, the par five second hole, they added 10 yards and they moved the tee box. Now, this has been a quote unquote easy par five, and I don't think it's going to affect scoring that much. Uh, now, another big change that we've seen in the last couple of years is they decided to go old school and eliminated some of the rust that had been added in certain areas over the last decade. Um, you know, when I went in 19, in 2017, what I noticed is the rough cut. The, you know, it's basically fringe back then. It was like the first cut of like a fringe. That that's how it was. I mean, it was barely anything, right? And then in the years afterwards, up until about 2022, right, they started growing the rough a, a little bit more. Uh, it, 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 it off the fairway around the greens. Um, you know, in areas like that. Uh, and so. What, what happened was, you know, it impacted some bailout zones off the tee, which, you know, now have the short grass, which in turn will make wayward shots even more wayward because they don't have that little bit of rough that's going to stop them. Another thing about adding that short grass and eliminating some rough is that there will be more spin on the ball from these areas, which used to be rough. The rough has actually helped golfers on holes with huge false fronts because the lack of spin kept balls off, you know, on the green instead of rolling off the front of the green into the collection area. What this does affect is when you hit the ball in that small rough, you don't have as much ball control, spin control, uh, you know, as, as you normally would from the fairway. So sometimes you can hit a lot of spin on it. Sometimes you can't. And it makes it hard to judge where you're supposed to land the ball for your second shot. When the rough was up, you knew that there wasn't going to be, and I, when I say up, I'm saying like inch, inch and a half, right? Instead of being almost negligible, like quarter inch rough is what you're going to see probably uh, by the fairways now. And so with that inch, inch and a half rough, 
you knew you weren't going to get much spin. And so golfers were able to project their ball, land it in front, and roll it up. Or if it was the pin was in the back uh, of the green, they could hit the front of the green and roll it up. Now, it makes it more difficult to see if the ball's going to roll forward or if it's going to spin a lot. They have a lot less control uh, when it comes down to it because it, it just depends directly on the lot. Uh, and these lies, you know, with the with the half inch, with the half inch grass, sometimes you know you, you're going to have less spin. Sometimes you're going to have more spin, and it's very very hard to pick that out when you're standing above the ball. Now, um, uh, let's see. Now off the tee, golfers, um, off the tee golfers are going to see tree line fairways with above average width, bunkers in the landing areas, and light rough. Uh, the fairways are heavily undulated and usually lush, so even though they'll have some roll. It's not like a U.S. Open where you know dry conditions can take can make the ball run out 50 yards or more. Also, uh, this year I think they've had over 12 inches of rain already. Uh, now the sub air system is pretty immaculate, and I don't think there's supposed to be any rain leading up to the event, so they should be able to have it firm and fast at least for that first round. But I do see maybe some rain uh, during the event, so we'll see how far they can actually you know do what they need to do uh, when it comes to that. Now, uh, uh, if golfers miss a fairway and hit it into the trees, they're going to have to deal with approach shots from the uh, soft pine straw, which is always tricky. Uh, water will also be in play on a few holes on the back nine. On approach shots, golfers are going to see greens that are above average in size, but that is misleading. Uh, first off, uh, you know most of the greens slope heavily from back to front, which makes hitting approaches under the hole important. Uh, there are also so many slopes and contours on the greens that they will have um that they will have small aiming points on approach shots to actually get the ball close also because of the correct landing spots uh, i'm sorry all, most greens are elevated and are shaped like an upside down bowl around the edges and have little to no rough surrounding them so many balls will be left in collection areas uh around the greens which are always tough to get up and down from because of firmness and quickness of the greens Unless the course gets hit by a deluge of rain, they should remain firm and fast, even if there are wet conditions. Uh, Augusta National, of course, some of the best sub-air drying machinery under the greens. We'll see how much it's put to the test this week. Uh, the greens are bent and will be uh, fast. Stimulating rain, 13 and a half or more. Uh, bunkers and collection areas surround almost every green with water surrounding a few holes. Tamma, what are you looking for in golfers? Yeah, it's a obvious spot like you said obviously we go through all that stuff anyway but for me it's going to come down to what we always talk about and we'll get there i think it's gonna be a good conversation but just game theory leverage the the one thing you'll hear all week i know we're sort of kicking it off there's a few other pods out there already but just in, in general about the course history and how it always comes through but i think just coming in in, in shape too we know we're going to talk about scheffler i just mentioned rory would make this more exciting if he does have a good finish at the valero because then there's more topic of conversation but for me it's the dfs stuff kenny uh just like everything there's 87 guys in it right now there's could be an 88th if a guy like uh, Batia gets in and gets the job done and then we'll see what he's priced probably in the 7k range just the way they do it so uh, the other thing with that is you can just knock a bunch of guys at the bottom off right so it's twofold we do not have the 5k price range this week but we still have I was just looking it up here we still have 44 of the 87 guys are 6900 or less so one thing they did do this week well, I'm just going to keep noting this every single week now it only went up um uh, Two guys, I think 18 to 20. The 7K range is still only 20 guys, even with the chain. So it just goes to show the the week-to-week stuff that we talked about these last few weeks where the 5K range was involved, where that's just throwing everybody in at the bottom and, and letting you run with it. So they, they did not change the 7K range. It's still only 20 guys, not 45. They kept Scotty at 12-1, not 13, like we've seen. And obviously, it's a stronger field, but also uh, they want people to be able to build these lineups out, right? There's a $10 on DraftKings this week with a million dollars up top, 475 or 495,000 entries. So they want your lineups to look good. I know people always say, well, what soft pricing matter? Because everyone has the same pricing. True. But what it means is this more, you just continuously roll. You're like, well, that one looks good, but I can sweat every single lineup has that 1v1 in six different places. If it's, you know, if you're on Xander, it could be Wyndham Clark or Neiman. If you're on Dustin Johnson, it could be Cam Smith or Justin Thomas. Like every spot in your lineup, can be interchangeable. So that's really what it means is more people throw more lineups in typically is what they're hoping for with 400K plus entries. So uh, we'll get to it, but I think there's definitely some different types of um, takes you can go with. But I know like 
just looking at it, you can almost tell already who's going to be popular in what range. So it'll be interesting when we talk through it to see if you have any different takes right now early on first first thing of the week here. Right. Now, one thing I will say about popularity at the Masters, chalk hits yes a lot at this event. And then the reasoning for that is uh, how sticky the course history is. It's the number one stickiest course when it comes to course history on two times. times. What's up? I'm just teasing. That's what I said. You're going to hear people say it. And there you go. You, you've said it twice. It is true. But it's it's the number one thing you're going to hear people say this week, obviously, is about that. So do you have a different take on it? I mean, you can go into why that is. But like, do, do you have anything else against it on what I, you think? I, look, I mean, what when I'm making my cast lineup this week, what I'm looking for is current form, horse form, good ball striking in the last 24. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple. Like, keep it simple, stupid basically is what it comes down to, in my opinion, for this event, especially in cash. Keep it simple, stupid, okay? You look at court, recent form, course form, ball striking in the last 24 uh, rounds. Uh, I think it's pretty simple to go in that route. You can find my, my, my cast lineup is already locked and loaded. It's been for a couple of days. I am not going to change it. These guys are the ones that I want in my cash lineup, and they all take into account and are all solid in recent form, course history, and ball striking in the last 24 rounds. And that's how I'm going about it. Now, the one question I do have for GDP's Tambo, how does how are the live players going to be owned? Or what are you doing with the live players when it comes to this event, when it comes to DFS? think it's pretty clear that's what i was saying earlier so it's a good question because i think that's kind of one of the things that comes up right away where it's like rom neiman cam smith will get played uh dj is right under cam smith and i currently think people will go to cam smith over dj i know there's some hype right now over live miami and people watching them and say it looks good and all these things but my point would be those are sort of the mains my wonder is what do people do with Brooks? Because, well, people always play Brooks at majors. They, you know, this is the one where finally it feels like they might not. We have Scotty on top of the world and for good reason. Rom, last year's champion. That's the last two champions, by the way. But just to note, I mean, they're right up top and, and five. Rom actually looks good over. Who cares? Live Miami, whatever, but it's still fine. And then Rory, everyone still likes Rory at the Masters. Everyone still likes Rory. I had, I joked, I had the bet with Mayo this week for the Valero. Um, you know, people said I influenced it. With the, with the Hideki stuff, but the point was Rory was still going to come in higher. People just play Rory. He's 10-8. If he ends up having an even better week than what we're seeing right now, sitting T4, T5, whatever it is at Valero, then he's into the mix. So do I guess, I think Rom, Cam Smith, and Neiman are the guys that people still play no problem. Maybe there's some others down the board. We know they're not playing Bryson, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But, what do you think, and it's a good segue into this top range, people do with Brooks Kepka? When the the range has Rory, Rom, Scheffler, and Wyndham Clark, who's been on fire and just came second at the players. Obviously, we know his last year. Mayo put out his uh what I liked when he called it was the May OWGR, and it's his rankings. And obviously Wyndham Clark. Great Graham show. Ford. Oh, well, I gotta say, you guys gotta check that show out. Really, really solid. Um, Pat put a lot of fucking effort into that. You could tell. And also, I think he had a show with the Gall Digest boys, uh, Christopher Powers and who's the other guy, Demo? I forget, but they they go over his rankings. I, I want I'm, I haven't listened to that yet, but make sure you go check out those shows because they are solid. Go I'm ahead, excited for that one though because that's where they're going back and forth and trying to grill him on it. Because man, yeah, um, you know people were teasing him about engagement farming. I told him from the start it's going to get incredible engagement. But the first day I sat down with him at the studio and he told me where Hideki and where Wyndham Clark were ranked, I was like, what are we doing here? But I said, I also don't want to be the guy on the other side of you battling you because you obviously have a reason behind it. I listened so far to the first one where he just breaks down the top 30 and good arguments. I guess it is tough to argue. It just feels so weird that Wyndham Clark's up there. It kind of matters like, what have you done for me lately? But when you place Wyndham Clark and he's in this upper tier we're about to get to, it is, you know, the the major, the, the signature events, the second at the players. I think it was second at the API. Wasn't he like back-to-back -back seconds to Scotty or something? It's just... If you follow what he's been doing, it's been phenomenal. Yeah, the back-to-back -back seconds when Scotty won. That's what it was. So just to say it, like, that's the interesting stuff where it's like it just doesn't feel right to see him up there. And then it's then the other angle of the live stuff you just talked about where it's so hard to place a guy like Brooks because, well, he has the five majors. It's like, well, if Wyndham 
is a what have you done for me lately guy, like the last year and a half, two years. Brooks still got the major, came second in the Masters, and has all the majors behind, but what else besides that? It just becomes a battle of this back and forth. So, really interesting stuff. I know there's going to be engagement around it. People saying, oh, it's he just put, he's not just putting those ranks. He put a lot of work into those rankings. It's good stuff, and it makes for good conversation because currently the rankings are completely messed up. So, we'll, we'll have to see how it goes, but I thought it was a lot of fun. Right. Okay. So when you when we, let's go to these top tiers, Brooks is going to be my highest own. Okay. It's it's Brooks at a major for ten thousand two hundred dollars. Uh, here's the thing: the six K range, not great, not great. It's not like what we've seen in right. these lower ranges here in the last month, two months, with the type of pricing that DraftKings has had. Okay. Um. Yeah, so so I'm gonna go. I, I like Kepka in this situation just because uh, if you're gonna say he's gonna be like looked over, I mean, especially in that case, because Kepka's gonna win another major this year. This guy, all he does is prep for these majors, and it makes it easier that this is what the second time he's done it uh, as a, a live golfer. You know, last year he still finished top ten at maybe runner up if I'm not mistaken, uh, and he, you know, he came he came in. And it was a brand new situation. He wasn't playing the PGA Tour. It wasn't normal. A lot of these guys have routines that they go through uh, before majors, and it, it probably didn't go probably didn't go the way he thought it was going to go, or you know, because he moved to lit right for last year, and he still balled out. Now he has another year under his belt. He the thing about Brooks is, especially if you watch him in like um, uh, in the full swings and stuff like that, like he takes a lot of. Um, effort into learning from his mistakes, right? Uh, that's one of the things that makes him so mentally strong uh, that he takes into account his errors and he does whatever he can uh, mentally or physically uh, to, to make sure those errors don't happen again at a major. Um, I think he's going to be readily prepared. Uh, I think he's top 10 right now in the first round of Doral. Doral, very similar uh, type, you know, long, driver-heavy, you know, type of course. Uh, that you're going to see at Augusta, a b bit more water. But uh, he's going to be my highest stone. I'm, he's going to be my highest stone golfer in every major this year because the man is just, this is what he does, right? He has five majors of what, 12 events he's won ever? Like, guys that have won five majors usually have like 50, 60 wins like in their career, right? This guy, all he gives a fuck about is these majors. He's going to come in fucking prepared. And I do not doubt that at all. I, I've already bet him, what, 20, 20 to 1? Um, yeah. Uh, I'm going to, I'm, he's going to be my highest own. Now, my first cash game cornerstone is going to be Scotty Shep. Um, again, what I want to see is Scotty Brooks, Rory, you know, in that final. The Sunday uh, last two pairings, stuff like that. It would just be so amazing. But, you know, Scotty Scott, um, you know, in cash, like I said, even if he doesn't play well, what's he going to finish? 10th? 12th? You know, the floor is so incredibly high with Scotty that I do not see how I cannot roster him in cash. Now, what this does when you roster Scotty in cash, because I made, when I started making my cash lineups, I made one. With Scotty and without Scotty, right? Uh, it took me a long time to find one with Scotty that I like. I was going to go balanced for a long, long time uh, until I started finagling some lineups, moving stuff around, and I finally got one uh, that I like. Um, and, and so it, it's going to be, it, it, it makes it tough to roster a, a lineup, but it is possible with Scotty for cash where you only have like one guy um, you know, in the 6K range and still be able to get a lineup with five guys who you think, you know, could win or top five this event, which I think my lineup has uh, this week. Now, the worry I have about John Rahm is what I spoke about Kepka last year. Now, Kepka sort of, you know, went against that narrative that I was speaking of because he finished so well, but these golfers all have a routine, like before they go into a major. They play certain amount of events. They, they they plan their schedule out based upon major play. And now you can't really do that with Liv, right? They're like, you're playing that. You're playing that. You're playing that. There is no, uh, let me take this week off to work on my game. Let me let me do this, uh, you know, and stuff like that. So I think 
you know, being a routine type guy like Rom is, I think that could affect him. Uh, other problems that I have is, you know, in the last seven years, the winner the following year has only finished inside the top 30. Price. Price. Right? Uh, definitely a narrative there, but still. Um, so Rom probably a fade for me. Uh, I hope he wins. They're out. Um, so his ownership goes up. And I hope he fails at the Masters because I am not going to be rostering him. What are you doing up top, Tamil? Um, I'm going to play Rom for sure, but I will just start on the other thing you said, which I thought was actually pretty interesting is going down, is that that's the secondary piece to what I brought up off the top when you kicked it to me about the, the 6K range is while there is X amount of guys that gets at 44, not very many of them are playable. So that's one interesting tidbit. Like you brought that up right away. It's not the same old 6K range that we've seen lately. You got to sort of take your choice. Mind you, Tiger Woods, by the way, 6,800 bucks this week down there with Chris Kirk and, you know, Poston and Strzok. There's some guys down there, but I guess what I will say is it's actually not that hard. No surprise because they didn't price him at 13K to roster Scotty Scheffler. So in cash, I get it. We're like, you know, you're used to being safe. I brought this point up too, Kenny, because we talked a little bit on this last week and I thought it was actually most interesting is typically in cash, and I haven't played a lot of cash, but people are looking to play it safe. They need six made cuts. They need... They're good to go, but you've proven with this new pricing structure that's, I know it's not here this week, but I'm going to tie it to this week in a second, where you said it last week. It's like, you can just punt and get a four or six and still dominate people because they're on all these guys that finish T40. They get all these six to sixes through and three guys suck. One guy's in the top 20. The other two are sort of mediocre in the middle. That's no good. Your, your six to six is no longer good if people can easily get to the top and then drop it down. So there's that. But for this week, it's like in GPPs, people think that, that you know, they have to go aggressive. You could play Scotty and use like one 6K guy and still fill it out with a ton of these sevens and eights that look pretty strong. So I think if you think it's going to be Scotty this week, why wouldn't you get him in there? Scotty, Rom look good up top. I I think what you want Rom to be, no one even is going to know if, you know, he wins lived. It'll be on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call, of course. But I mean, it's not the same if Rory wins this week. That is going to blow his ownership up at 10-8 because it's just so nice to have that money from Scotty down to Rory. People will build lineups like that, so that's fine. But I think you're going to get Brooks overlooked. What you were talking about where he came second um, here last year, and then he le he said he wouldn't tell his quote-unquote secret, but the very next event, he went out and won the very next major, sorry, the PGA Championship, he went out and won it. He said, I, I learned from my mistake. I figured it out. So what did you figure out? I said, I'm not going to tell you everything. Who knows? Remember, he was behind Cantlay playing super slow, and he said everyone blamed that. And he said that got in his like people said that got in his head and all those different things. So for me, Scotty Rom, and then probably one of Rory and Brooks, and I'm gonna continue to disrespect Wyndham Clark, and that's fine. Maybe he beats me. He beats me. Um, you know, it's Wyndham Clark at 10K with Brooks, Rom, Scheffler, Rory, and a bunch of dudes in the 9K that I can make a case for too. He people say it. Stop shitting on him. He's beat up on those 9K guys. I get it. It's just when you're tying everything together and the course, typically look at like a Hovland, 21st, 27th, then pops the 7th. You know what I mean? Like other guys, Call Morikawa, 44th, 18th, then a 5th and a 10th. You've talked about this plenty in the past. You kind of got to fiddle your way around here a little bit first and see what you can find out about the course. And if you keep it rolling, like Wyndham's been playing, he'll, he'll, he'll crush me. But there's a lot of other guys that I could play. So up front early, Friday night, Scotty, Rom. One of Brooks or Rory, probably Brooks, is what I'm thinking right now. All right, before we get into the night theory, I will say your Canadian brethren, Corey Connors, is fucking my underdog. Pick him right now. Shooting three over uh, at Valero. Make sure you use promo code MAYO. Get yourself a uh, deposit match up to $100 on underdog fantasy. He's killing me. He's killing me, Tambo. He's killing me. All right, so let's move on to this 9K range. Here's the thing why I feel okay using Scheffler in cash. Another reason. I'm not the biggest fan of the 9K range except for two golfers. First one's going to be Xander Schauffele. Again, keep it simple, stupid, especially when it comes to elite golfers. Um, guys playing unbelievable golf. Ball striking has been solid. He has great course history here. I could have used him in cash. He was in my cash lineup in the um, in the in the in the one where uh, I'm not going stars and scrubs and stuff like that in the balanced lineup. Uh, I have him as my highest, but I decided not to go that route. Um, and so I'm going to use a bunch of them in GPPs. I'm going to keep it simple. Uh, I'm not going to overthink this. Uh, he's playing the best out of basically everybody uh, in the 9K range, except when I'm Clark um, and so uh, and Hideki, which I'll get to. Uh, and so I'm going to play him. 
Um, Hideki, my second favorite player uh, in this range. Nine casing is very cheap for a guy who's been playing unbelievable golf. For a guy who's won this event before. Uh, and the thing is, like, once you win this event, like, number two sort of comes a lot easy, easier, right? I mean, we've seen it with different golfers. I mean, do you really think Bubba's like a, you know, Bubba has two of these things, right? Like, how great of a golfer is he? I mean, he's good, really good. Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, he's a two-time master winner. And there's a bunch of golfers out there that have won multiple times. And I can see the deck he's doing this. 28 to 1 is what I got him. Uh, eight places. So I went ahead and took that bet. Um so uh, those are the two guys I like, and I'm definitely going to play, and I'm going to keep it simple and play those guys. Now, other guys you might want to pivot to because those guys are going to be chalky. Uh, that's what it's going to come down to. Uh, if you want to pivot, I mean, Spieth, probably not a pivot. He's probably going to be popular, especially the way he played Friday uh, at the uh, at Valero to make the cut. I expect him to do well this weekend, and I expect his ownership to be you know, 15 to 20%, which is not nothing. Um, Hovland is the guy that I might play. And I know he has been playing like garbage and he doesn't follow the keep it simple, stupid narrative. Um, it's other than the ball striking, the ball striking has been fine, right? Um, it, it's his around the green game, which has just been absolutely horrid. Um, so what I am hoping for him is and he hits enough greens where he doesn't have to worry about the around the green play. I'm not going to go heavy on him, uh, but I do think it's worth a play. If you told me at the uh, end of last season that Hovland would be 9,500 at the Masters, you would have been like, what the fuck, right? You know, you know, like, it's crazy. At that point in time, he was the best golfer in the world. Um, do I think he can win? No. Do I think he can top five, top 10? Skill level wise, yes, I, I I don't see a problem with that. Uh, I, I, I'll probably end up using him. It's either going to be him or Neenan, uh that I'll use as my third play uh, in this range. Tampa, like a, like a lot more of these guys than you, but it's not really that crazy because like I said I'm not going to be going nuts down low. There's lots of different ways to build. You can put three of these guys in and skip the top. It's scary with Rory, Rom, Scheffler, Brooks. Those guys up there, you can use the Scheffler drop to one of these guys but I will say this you you hit it good you said imagine at the end of last season sort of start of the new season if you said this about Victor Hovland I'm not sure if you will remember back to this probably not because a lot of edibles along the way and whatnot but if you go back to our season preview do you remember who I picked for the Masters I do not remember it was Scotty the obvious but we hadn't I mean I didn't know he was already almost winning everything it wasn't like a big thing but it was Scotty again or Hovland and I said, I'm going to reverse it. If it's not Hovland at the Masters, I kind of like him at the Open. I just thought about that. But the big thing about it was, I think the joke back then was, he's been in Butler Cabin before. There's only one one way to get back in there again. He was in there as an amateur, low am, but now you got to go back here. Um, what I said earlier, 32nd that year, but then since 21st, 27th, and then a 7th place. So, uh, you know, definitely something special. I think it was the Tiger Woods year. That he was in there. Tiger Woods gets a win in 2019. I think that was the year that Hovland was in there. So um, crazy enough as it is, you got him coming in seventh here last year. I don't really care what have you done for me lately. It's, yeah, risky, but that's the whole point of him being a GPP player. I actually feel better about Hovland than I do about Cantlay. And Cantlay's history here is up and down and whatnot. He's not playing the greatest late, lately either. But I do like Hovland. Uh, Neiman, we'll see how it goes. Obviously, the popularity on him is going to stem from the three live where the two live wins and the and the Asian tour win that he got, and obviously playing incredible golf, but still like Xander better right there. So I probably lean like Xander, Hovland, and then I don't know what the the Oberg ownership is going to look like, but Hideki's right there. And I think after this week, it's probably not going to be that high. I don't even know who's going to make the cut. Yeah, I will say this, if uh, if Hideki gets extremely popular and Cam Smith is the guy that's pulling it for live guys because he's that Best Buy pricing at 8900 in that X range, would you have any interest in like Ludwig and Zalatoris at 9 and 90, or sorry, at 9100 and 9200 in that squeeze range of Hideki and Spieth who always get love based on the course history and their, their records here, the Green Jackets? Yeah, I mean, Zalatoris is interesting. I mean, I know he hasn't been playing great golf, but it seems like he all he's sort of like a, a mini Brooks, right? He sort of elevates his game at the majors. Mm -hmm. uh, and if he's going to be single digit, I don't think he. Do you think it's possible that he's single digit? I just don't know because I like you just said, like if you if people are going to go the guys up top, 
We know Xander's going to get some love. We know Speed's going to get some love. We know Decky is going to get some love. Then it's like, aren't the secondary guys probably Obland and Cantlay and Ludwig? Like, how does Zal get it? I don't know. I know he has a second and a sixth here, but how does it just land on him? I, I have a hard time believing it would. So somebody in here is getting squeezed. I kind of like some of the, if I like outliers, it's probably more in the 9K range for me personally. That's what I'll say. If it's the Hovlins, the Cantleys, the Zalatoris, Ludwig for a first timer, if instead of Clark, let me go down to Ludwig and, and play him. Like it's, it's 900 bucks cheaper. He does not have the same resume Clark has, but I'm going to just play it for 900 bucks. I'll find that gets me off the 6K range up to the sevens where there's a ton of guys that we're going to like, we get down there. So that's where I'm at early on. It's tough to say, but that's just my first thoughts coming in. Hideki obviously is the one that looks like good chalk because it's 9K. The price just seems way off. Uh, the Mayo rankings might have me uh, have me leaning that way because of how high up the board he had him. But honestly, 9K doesn't seem, um, doesn't seem high enough. And even with the injury scare stuff this week, that, you know, I was just posting out what I found as I always do information. I still played him. I, I leave him like I do. He made the cut. He's through the cut line. So whatever, whatever. We'll see how he does. I think he's like 36th going into the weekend. And, and we'll see where he goes from there. But I have interest at 9K. 8K range has a bunch of guys too. So it's interesting to see how it goes. All right. So let's go to this uh, 8K range. I got three kick mid simple stupid plays right here. Three of them in this range. The first one's going to be my cash game cornerstone. It's going to be Cam Young. Uh, at $8,500, number two in ball striking in the last 24 rounds. Good form coming in with a runner-up his last time out. Good course history with a top 10 last year. Again, keeping it simple, following those rules. That's going to be my second cash game, Cornerstone. Two other guys that fit that bill uh, coming into this is Tony Fina. Um, again, form improving, getting better. Uh, uh, the uh, ball striking, top five on tour. Since the beginning of the year. I know his results haven't been where he wants. But his ball striking numbers have been top five on the PGA Tour since the beginning of this season. Um, also, he is, um, of course, he's he's finished well here before in the past. I mean, he broke his damn ankle and finished in the top ten uh, just a few years ago. So he has the course form. Keeping it simple. Lastly, keep it simple stupid. Shane Lowry. Okay? $8,000. Ball striking has been really, really strong form very very good couple top tens here recently in the last couple of months and of course he's made every cut here and he has good solid course history keeping it simple those are the three guys that i will key on uh in the 8k range but a lot of people will key on that I, the guy that i like i like dj i'm gonna play dj just because he's my favorite golfer i don't really need to have any reasons for him he's my favorite golfer i don't get to see him that often i want to have a little sweat on him uh, even if it is just for a day around one. The one thing I will say is, you know, he was on a lot of featured groups last year during the majors. The one thing I noticed in every single major that he played um, was that it wasn't like the laissez-faire, I don't give a fuck type DJ. It was a DJ where if he made a mistake, he'd mutter under his breath. You could tell that, uh, you know, hitting a bad shot would bother him, that it meant something to him to be at these majors and play well. I do expect him to have at least one more renaissance at a major to win his third. It's going to happen, I think, um, at some point in time. The skill level is just too good, and and and, and, he, and, he, and he knows that that's where his legacy will be made. Um, you know, if he's just a two-time major winner with this killy ass, people are going to be like, you underachieved. If he gets three, it's a pretty good number, right? There's not that many people with three majors out there. There's a bunch with two, right? Not that many with three. Um, and so uh, I think his focus is going to be there. So I, I, that's why I'm going to play DJ. Uh, but I like, I'm going to go Homa. I know he sucked in majors. I know he hasn't been great. But at some point in time, he's going to come through. Um, and at this price point at $8,400 for a guy who's won, what, four or five times in the last three years, I'm going to go ahead and take that risk at a cheap price. Uh, I do not expect him to be popular. I do not expect him to be highly owned. Uh, it was maybe 10 to 12%. It'll be easy to use 20% of them and be double the field uh, in GVPs. Uh, he's sort of like my pivot and play uh, in the 8K range. Tambo. Yeah, I really um, you know, have a few guys in here that I like. And that's like you said, up in the 9K range, if I'm just playing some of these randoms, that's how you can get to these guys. I think some of them will be popular. You mentioned like B now, Lowry obviously look really good sort of across the board, like Fidel coming off a hot result, made all the cuts, 
You talked about his history. You go to Lowry, four straight top 25s here. It's just something that sets up well for him. And he's been playing great for top, well, a, a 29th and then three top 20s before that, including two top fours. So they're not going to be sneaky. I get it. But there is other guys in this range. If people are playing Cam Smith, I like DJ, what you said there. Uh, one interesting note, new caddy narrative. Don't really care what he's been doing lately for whatever reason. Same thing here. Justin Thomas, besides last year, has made every cut here. And he's played it like what? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like eight or nine years before. So it's like, he's fine. I think and some of his results are really good. So uh, he'd be off the board. And the thing is, I like Cam Young. I like what he's been doing lately. He pops up in the stats more than this guy that I'm about to mention. But it's a guy that never won. Like he has a seventh year last year. He's never won on the PGA Tour. You got a two-time major winner underneath him. Call him more cow. 8,400. I mean, it's, all, it's pretty disrespectful, I think. I don't care what people say about what his recent play is. Fifth, 10th. 18th, he do, he gets it done at this course regardless, and the price tag is down there with like Bryson and Cam Young and Tony Finau. We you know we talk about Finau's history, you're fine, but like Colin Morikawa, 8400, and if people don't want to play him, I I'd like him. Play Lowry. I am. I'd rather say, but you're. I'm talking about me. Um, if it's me versus you, and you got Max Home, I'll just play Cow. Like if I had to pick, I'm playing Lowry. I'm playing Finau. I get that. I'm saying, but you can get away with DJ, JT, and Morikawa here and, and be just fine I think and you could fit a couple of those guys in you could go like a Rom with two of these guys like okay go back to this one Kenny this just reminded me of something we've been doing a lot of these shows together my friend I'm definitely gonna miss you but I will say this Rom what do you say like for two years now you said it there's two guys you're gonna play at every major Rom and Morikawa and now today it sounds like neither of them but you you I'm are gonna play kick yourself later shit changes oh shit changes yeah because that's what great. You, not playing. Said. you just talent plays you said I'm just gonna bet on talent I don't give a shit what they're doing coming in. These but guys the got majors. Is, but the thing is, like, it's not like there's, it's devoid of talent around them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, Hall is talented. You know, Cam Young's talented. Like, it's like, not like, you know, yeah, they're, the home they're, is the perfect board. one. The home what? is the perfect one. You said it. The home is the perfect one. Oh, he's eventually going to show up when he has it. Yeah. I, I see yeah, just well, all well, the well, here's the thing. Here's the thing you always say in the years that you've been on. Uh, you want to get there early, right? You want to sure. get there? Early, you know who I pegged right? for the PGA Championship? Remember, I gave Max Homa the JT love. I said once JT started picking up the wins, and then he gets the PGA Championship. So I actually have Homa pegged for the PGA Championship. So maybe Kenny, he shows up for you here, little spark, gets a little feeling in the blood, and then takes it on the next month. And then when we're back at the PGA Championship, well, talking I mean, I mean, about it, at eighty-four hundred dollars, top ten will be money, right? Sure, eighty-three. Yeah, I mean, top ten will be pretty fucking early. My guy, yeah. work out. You got you got even a hundred bucks less. So. Anything you can do here with like Bryson, Burns, any you know anything you want to do with those two guys, just let them be. Nah, okay. Uh, they're cool. getting this zone suit. No, um, seven K range. Tell me what. Yeah, looking at it here now, like the the seven K range is still enticing when you're seeing guys. I know we'll get to the Corey Connors conversation in a second, but even like Pigala, um, Hatton, some of these guys, just the the prices look too good. So just going back to some of it here, I had a couple things tagged up, but um. Brian Harmon, the uh, the thing we all we, people were making fun of him, the little big game hunter, hasn't had the best history here, missed the cut the last two years, but recently been playing pretty good again in these stronger events. So if you want to get a, a GPP play in there, something that's a little bit off the board, Corey Connors is going to be the chalk. He's going to pop. I'm not sure if you have him in your cash game cornerstones, but people always love a good Corey Connors play. Last year, missed cut, but still before that, everything else was good. And then after that, it really is like dropping down to the bottom. Siwoo Kim. $7,100. I don't know if people are going to go to him or not. Maybe they will, but man, he's down there coming in off a 30th, 6th, 17th, before that, the 12th and the 14th. He has only missed the cut here once, and it was back in 2017. He's played it every year since. So Siwoo is going to look good. And then I think the guy that, like, just I'll play on talent alone, like, well, like Hatton was doing everything in the world last year. He's 7,600, well below the average price point, and nobody's going to like him because he just doesn't do good at the Masters, but that would be a guy that I'd be inclined to take a shot on versus like a Homa, for example. I, I would still take a shot on a guy like Hatton instead. So in this top, I like Thiegel. He's going to be my third cash game cornerstone. You know, 18th in ball striking in the last 24 rounds. Really, really good form. Top 10 last year. Keep it simple, stupid. Uh, that's, that's going to be my formula for this week. Keeping it simple. He's going to be my third cash game cornerstone. No problems are there. My final cash game cornerstone, once again, keep it simple, stupid. It's going to be Siwoo Kim at $7,100. Uh, the thing about Siwoo, ball striking, seventh in the field of ball striking in the last uh, 24 hours. Seventh in this field 
in ball striking in the last 24 rounds. Again, he's had some really good finishes uh, this season. A couple of top tens, more than a couple. And he has good form uh, at Augusta. So, cash game cornerstones for this week. They're going to be Scotty Scheffler at 12,100. Cam Young at 8,500. Um, Deagola at 7,700. Siwoo Kim at 7,100. At least like 14,7, 14,6 to fill out the rest of your lineup. Uh, and, you know, and the thing about this is if you look at these guys, it's pretty simple. Ball striking, Scheffler's number one. Uh, Cam Young, number two in ball striking. Um, I have Lowry. He's in my cash lineup. He's number six in ball striking. Deagle is 18 in ball striking, but an unbelievable putter and really good on par fives. And still 18th in ball striking in this field is pretty damn good. Okay. Siwoo Kim is going to be, um, you know, he's in my cash lineup. He's seventh in this field in ball striking. And then I'll go to my last guy here when we get down to the 6K range. But here's the thing about this. I'm going to be playing Hatton, just like you said. Uh, Fitzy at 7,900 seems very interesting at a at a discount type price. I really want to see what Fitzy's ownership is going to be uh, because he's definitely long enough now where I think he can contend uh, at this event. He has a good short game. You know, it's going to come down to basically his iron play, uh, and we'll see how that goes. He can have good weeks. He can have bad weeks, but he's already a major champion. He knows what to do in these type of situations. $7,900 seems like a deal, uh, right? But the one guy um, that I, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to play him, I'm going to play Fleetwood. At 7,500, he showed me a little something. Uh, you know, I watched a lot of him yesterday in the featured group. I, you know, he's doing all right today. He's looking strong. He's coming in here, 7,500. You know, you're getting about a thousand, thirteen hundred dollar discount from where he usually normally has been at the Masters for the last four or five years. Okay, and then I also like Patrick Reed. Tambo, if I told, if I asked you who you thought had the most birdies and eagles. In the last five years at Augusta, what do you think? What would your answer be? My answer would be Patrick Reed. Only because, because you said Reed. his name before. But yes, yes it is Patrick Reed. Patrick like, Reed, most birdies, most eagles at Augusta last five years. I don't even think that includes his winning year, right? Uh, because he won in what, 2018? So 18, 19, 20, 21, 20. Yeah, it doesn't even include the year he won, right? So, so the five years after he won, he is... Top five. Uh, he is number one in birdies or he, in eagles at Augusta. And that's saying something. It doesn't matter the form. His stats always suck. But for some reason, you get his ass over here, dude can fucking ball out. Now, here's the thing about the 7K range. I'm not the biggest fan of the 6K range. But I really like this lower 7K range. 7,200 to 7,000. I mean, first off, I'll go with, with Justin Rose. Right, Justin Rose is my pick to win the win. Uh, in the beginning of the year. I had to have one, like, out there pick. And I felt like, you know, the way he was playing last year, coming up with the victory, he'd been playing like garbage uh, this year. But I still got to ride it. I can't, like, not play him after in the first show that we did for the season. Be like, hey, uh, I'm, uh, I think Justin Rose is going to win the fucking Masters. Uh, anyways, so so I'm going to stick with him. Um, and I'm going to stick with him. But, I mean, like, you go down from Henley, Rose, Siwoo, Adam Scott, Jaeger, Nick Taylor is the guy that I sort of like at 7,000. I expect, you know, all the other names that I just spoke to have a lot more ownership than Nick Taylor. But Nick Taylor, he's been playing very good golf, you know? The one in the waste management, one in Canada last year, right? Um, you know, eighth, uh, you know, top 10 in approach, top 10 in putting, top, 22nd in ball strike in this field for a guy that's $7,000. I'm going to play uh, a little bit of Nick Taylor down here. Tambo, who do you like in the lower range? Anybody? Yeah, I was just going to say, some of the stuff I missed, like when I just named three or four off the top, but when you go back and look, like just some of the other stuff that popped out. So Fitz is eight or nine made cuts in a row here with like a 10th, a 14th, the 21st, like seven. So he's all over it. You go to, um, who's the other guy? We already talked about Connors. We know what his top 10s were like. Uh, you mentioned, oh, Fleetwood. And he's playing good right now. It's one, two, three, four, five, six made cuts in a row with three top 20s in there. Again, you just need him to pop a couple other strokes here this way or that way at a price like 7,500, and he's good. You mentioned Reed. It's five made cuts since the win, and that's what you were talking about, the fourth place last year, the eighth and the tenth 
after his win back in 18, like all that. And then you go to, uh, who's the other guy? Adam Scott. Never missed a cut here. One, two, three. Like his win was way back in, what was it, 2013? Played every year since. His worst, he's, he's got a bunch of top, like, okay, like a 42nd, whatever. But like, you know, mostly the last three years, not strong, but really still made the cut. And who knows what he can come through and do this year. And then Russell Henley. The other guy, fourth last year, 30th, 15th, 11th, 21st. It dates back, but just makes the cut, gets the job done. So I like that. And I love your Nick Taylor call. I just went to look him up from a betting perspective. Not the bet, like, the even the numbers cut because people kind of are feeling it, I think. Like, they just know what he's capable of. What is he, like 80? Yeah, 80? It's like 80. 80 to 110, depending on what you want for each way or things like that that I was looking at. But, again, I think he's fine. And then one thing I will say, too, your boy, my boy. I see we were like 110, too. For sure, yeah, with, but with eight places, I feel better about him too. I will say that, but like Steven Yeager, just won, and do I think it's going to trickle over and he's going to put on the green jacket? Absolutely not. No. I'm talking about seventy one hundred dollars and a shitty six k range for not the most part. So it's like, can he get me that top twenty and just do his thing and come through? I don't know because people say first timer, but sometimes it's less stress too, right? And again, not saying he's going to win it. Less stressed. I'm talking, can he come through at seventy one hundred? And your guy Justin Rose, you mentioned, so there's a bunch. But I think that's okay because even if you're playing some of these guys and they're getting popular, they're getting what they're going to be kept in check by the rest of this range, 20 guys, and the 6K range is not strong, so they'll get some more ownership that way. But there's other guys we talked about in the eights, nines, and up top, like you. If you're heavy Brooks Kepka, that means you're not going to be as heavy on, let's say, Rom, Rory, Wyndham, etc. So you're already different, even if you have the same 7K I'm guys. I'm contemplating like, just rostering Kepka and Scheffler in that 10K range and just calling it a day. Right, so you're gonna going to going going a bunch on um going a bunch on Xander. Now, I think I can adjust that. It's, it's either I'm going to play Wyndham Clark or Rory. Uh, probably is what's going to come down to, uh, in that top range. So we'll have to see. And I do got to say, uh, everything bad I said about Corey Connors, I take back. He just went eagle birdie to get back to even. And so I have a underdog play right now. It was Oberg and Henley to finish minus one or better, or seventy one point five. Or, or or lower. Uh, they're both at even par right now with a couple of holes left. So I'm going to be sweating that. And then I had uh, Spieth uh, higher than 2.5 bogeys. And he hey, he missed a three-foot putt on 18 uh, to get me that third third bogey. So I'm sweating that out. Remember to use promo code MAYO. Get yourself a deposit match up to $100 uh, on Underdog Fantasy. It's great. Yesterday, did I tell you what happened? Yesterday, I had a, I had a one with um, Fitz, Fitzy. The uh, uh, over 18 and a half strokes or Bleak more than 18 and a half strokes for par fives on 18. He hits it into the creek. It bounces out of the creek, like to the back of the green. And he made birdie. I wanted to murder somebody. Was, was it Fleetwood? Or really wanted to murder I thought it was Fleetwood. That was Fleetwood. Did I, what did I say? Yeah, you said Fitzy. I, I thought it was Fleetwood. Uh, you're right, Fleetwood. You're right. That's what I meant. You know, those English folks, they, they, they all look and sound alike to me. I hit uh, my underdog again. I hit my two two man on that. People were loving that. So, oh, it, did you? Good. Yeah. The um, nice. I want to ask you this, though, because you loaded your question with Patrick Reed, so I knew your answer was Patrick Reed. But we forgot there was somebody in the 7K range that tied with Brooks Kepka for second place here last year. Do you remember who it was? Phil? Lefty. Yeah, I thought about him. I thought about Phil. Like, he's another like, guy like Reed, where they just come here and they magically just figure it out. Like, it's right? nuts. Second, even when the people are, oh, yeah, whatever, 21st. Oh, yeah, we're 18th. Like, in the, three of the last four years, that's like what he's finishing. Like, that's nuts. And he wants the Tiger story. Like, I don't even think he's finishing the top 30 on live this season so far. Really? <laughs> Yeah, I and he'll go like back. A, I think he got a sixth place in one of them. He got one, one top 30, maybe. I don't know. He hasn't been great. Uh, I what he's doing this week at Live Miami as we're on here right now. Well, uh, so 6K range, my favorite play. He's going to be in my cash lineup. Again, keep it simple, stupid, right? It's going to be Taylor Moore at $6,400. Made the cut last year, top 30 in his de debutant. So I count that as, you know, pretty good course for him, right? Hasn't missed the cuts is the Open Championship. Since the Open Championship, he has not missed a cut. And I think he's like 30, 34th in this field in ball striking. But he's been very, very good. He recently, last couple times out. Of course, he could put his ass off. Also, excellent around the green. For a $6,400 golfer, 
to be able to get like five guys like Siwoo, Siegela, Lowry, Cam Young, and Scheffler, who I think, you know, when it comes to Siegel and it comes to um, Siwoo, they can top five. The other three could win, in my opinion. Maybe not Cam. I don't get your first win uh, at Augusta's weird. So maybe those three would be top five. And then Lowry and um, Scheffler, I think, could win. You know, it's it's worth going down here and finding a putt. And all you want this putt to do in cash is to make the cut. And this guy has been a cut maker, playing exceptionally well. The form is pretty good. A bunch of top 25s. I think since the Open Championship, I think he's like 40% of his starts. He's finished inside the top 25. So, so give me Taylor Moore uh, down there as my final cast play. So you guys know my cast line uh, as of now. Other guys uh, that I will be playing uh, down here, you know, Woodland. Gary Woodland at $6,400 gained like 12 strokes T degree the last time he was out. I forget what tournament it was. He gained like nine strokes on his approaches. Like nine strokes in one event off the team. He finished 21st. <laughs> right so his putter his putter was shit right his putter was fucking shit but you could be a shitty putter and still win this fucking event Sergio uh you know uh Hideki uh blah blah yeah, 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 it just happens you could be a shitty putter and still you know do well here um so I do like Woodland he's showing a lot of you know I mean that showed a lot the last time he played I know Baroff would approve 100 percent uh Kenny Ama 6400 dollars again Top 15 in ball striking um, in this field at $6,400, right? Just go ahead and give me some of that when it comes to the people that cheap. Um, you know, outside of that, people that I'm looking at, um, Sergio, uh, Pavon, because Pavon has just been unbelievable. Uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppe Straka. Those are other guys that I'm looking for. But the ones I pointed out are the ones I'm really interested in, Tama. Yeah, a couple lib guys down here that aren't, aren't probably going to get played that I would have some interest in are the two you talked about. Just go go back to what we, we've we been saying the whole show. It's, you know, Sergio and Bubba. They're both actually playing good at Doral right now, but who cares? But I'm just saying, like, setting that up, they both obviously have their track record here. They got the green jackets. You, you mentioned it. Like, I, I think that's something you could just go to. The, the ones that's other th that I would go to, like uh, Chris Kirk, if you just need a cut maker, like, stats-wise, pops across the board, came 23rd here last year. I think he'd be fine. Keegan Bradley... 23rd here last year. Hasn't been doing as much lately, but again, if you're looking at the stats, last 24, last 50 type rounds, he's another guy that pops up. After that, I guess like down here with like Glover. Glover's showing up, and then you go back here, and it's like a 30th, a couple years, 11th recently. He's doing well this week. Like, could you play him at 6,300? Probably. I don't know. Uh, after that, it gets pretty tricky, man. Like you said, the Taylor Moore thing I get, making cuts, doing his thing that way. Um, Man, Ekrot, maybe Ekrot could be, you know, the GPP version if people do jump on to Taylor Moore, like he's 100 bucks less, he's got the win recently, 36, 45th, playing good this week, solid stats across the board, coming out for the first time, but still, uh, these guys are not needing to do anything, they just gotta get through, score for you a little bit, and make your lineups work if you got the right combination of dudes up top, so, um, like you said, not an incredible 6k range, you can take a bunch of guys out of here and, and just move on from there. But for now, um, you know, look, looks like a mostly 7K guy. We went through pretty heavy in that 7K range. I think that's for good reason, Kenny. I think you're going to have to get unique with roster construction. You leave a few bucks on the table, but you, you really want to just get unique with a few of the plays within your lineup. And you don't have to go down to the 6Ks to punt off if you don't want to. All right, that sounds good. Um, bets, I got two. I got Kepka 20 to 1. And I got Hideki 20 to 1 with eight places each way. Like it? I got uh, just one, and it was a bear off bet. He got me on it. Bear off Bubba bet. Matter of fact, bet Bubba 180 with the top eight each way. I was like, ah, maybe. I don't know. Like, sure. you could look at some of those other guys down there. I'm going to look at the card seriously when I get to it over the weekend and just sort of mm -hmm. spend more time on it. I I'm going to wait until the reset on Monday also yes. to see what new numbers are going to be out there. Uh, so I'll have the rest of my bets uh, on Gup's Corner. Also, we will both. Are you going to do an underdog play? We'll post some. No, yeah, I think right, we got yeah. one. So underdog. Mayo and I will cover down the in studio show too. We're doing it. Oh, yeah, you Tuesday guys are doing the draft okay. this week, so well, we'll have everything I'll post, going there. I'll post my underdog play when they come out. Uh, my guess is probably Monday or Tuesday. Uh, just check my uh, check my feed. You can find me on Twitter 
uh, on X uh, at Kendo VT. You can find the article every week on gupscorner.com. Use promo code uh, Kenny. Uh, I'm sorry. I think so. Yeah, Kenny, save yourself 30% on a sub to Gup's Corner. Tambo, I got to say. Okay, go ahead. Great run. It's been Thanks. fun. I'm going to miss you. Uh, and again, anytime you want to come back, uh, once everything start, once you, once everything's not so busy and you got more time, just come on back. We'll, we'll have you. But for the fans out there listening, the uh, the new host, it should be a good one. We're gonna, we already have good chemistry. Uh, I've been on his show before, so there's a little teaser uh, when it comes down to it. So make sure you check back next week for the surprise. Who our new, uh, who our new co-host is going to be. It, everything's going to run the same. Nothing's going to change. We should still be having some, some fun and making some motherfucking money. Tambo, why don't you tell me what I can find you? Yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun. I will say this. When you post your underdogs, though, first off, make sure you do that link. I like that little link where you can just, can I just tail this guy and click it? It's been fun. I know a lot of people in our Discord over at Shipping Nation, really, that's pretty sweet. I can just do it. Mayo's been doing it as well. So that's a cool feature over at Underdog. If you're not there, check it out. Use the code Mayo. Get the $100 or 100% bonus up to 100 bucks. 200 bucks is what you'll start with. And then you can go like Kenny and just put 200 on every bet, your first one and done. Or you can play it responsibly and just bet a little bit here, a little bit hey, there. it wasn't my money. Game. I could be irresponsible with shit that's not my money. <laughs> yeah. I, I will say, I do got to say, again, thank you to everybody out there. All the support all along. It's been incredible. Like you said, I think it's five, six years, whatever it's been, that we've been doing it. And five it's and an awesome. Half. Partner in crime. Love it. Right? We'll see what happens. I'll definitely be back for the majors. You'll still be able to find me on Ship It Nation, on the show with Mayo on Wednesdays. Just getting some other stuff together while taking care of things over at the nation. But if you guys want to check it out, go to shipitnation.com this week. You can find me in the Discord over there. You can use the code Mayo for 10% off. Check everything out that we've got going on the site for Masters. If you get just a weekly, you'll get everything. If you get a monthly, all access, whatever you want to do. But Kenny, been an absolute pleasure, pleasure, my friend. I love working with you. I do appreciate it. Thanks again to everybody out there. You can follow me on X at Totag and Tambo. Other than that, it's been great, and we'll talk soon. All right, that sounds good, Tambo. I will miss you. It was a nice run, uh, you know. And this is a great week, first major of the year. This is the week to really let's win some motherfucking money, DJ Nation. Sriracha, trip them up with the words. I done popped them out.